Welcome this evening. My name is Jim Fetzer. I'm a former Marine Corps officer, McKnight University professor emeritus on the Duluth campus of the University of Minnesota. Over 2,000 doctors have been taken out of their professions by techniques like those you are going to learn about today and where our very first presentation will be made by Dr. Billy Hurwitz uh, which he gave at the Cato Institute in 2014. Listen for the pattern that he describes here with extraordinary clarity because you're going to find this pattern is replicated in case after case that we are also going to discuss here this evening. Dr. Horwitz. We're going to turn now to uh, another federal agency and another case. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. William Hurwitz, and he's going to tell us about his nightmare encounter with the DEA and federal prosecutors. Now, when you normally think of the DEA, you normally think of uh, agents that are conducting raids and trying to uh, you know, uh, stop gangs from smuggling narcotics into the country and from selling them on the black market. But the DEA also has jurisdiction over doctors uh, who prescribe medicines. And the problem that has arisen in this area is that the line between an appropriate and lawful uh, administration of drugs and prescriptions and the illegal and inappropriate uh, administration of drugs has become very murky. Please welcome Dr. William Hurwitz. Well, I'm glad I could be with you here today, too. In the first trial, uh, which concluded in, I think, 2004, I was sentenced to 25 years in prison. And during the sentencing hearing, uh, one has an opportunity to have one's friends and supporters give little talks to the judge in hopes of softening their response. I felt as if it was a eulogy at my own funeral. I thought that I'd give you some background. My case really occurred in the context of changing attitudes toward pain management and opioids and a reaction by the federal regulatory authorities and now by the various boards of medicine to what has been perceived as an epidemic of drug abuse diversion. The attorney uh, was being prescribed by me 100 five milligram oxycodone pills a day. And I don't know if, how many people take 100 pills a day, probably not too many. But from the point of view of most laymen, that looks like a lot of pills. And what's hard to understand from, for, what shall I say, the uninformed here, is that the progression of tolerance to opioids is a geometric progression. If one doesn't work, take two. If two don't work, take four. If four don't work, take eight. The distinction as you double the dose is the same, and tolerance develops pretty quickly. So as you increase the dose, you can get to pretty high numbers. And it turns out if you don't increase the dose, opioids sensitize the body to pain. So starting somebody on opioids and not giving them enough to compensate for the increased sensitization, in effect, is condemning them to somewhere to, to being an effect on the borderline between withdrawal and increased pain. So my strategy, in accordance with and in compliance with the general instructions about opioid therapy, was to titrate the dose to effect. There was a day in 1991, the fall of 1991, when DEA agents and people from the DC, uh, what's it, what do they call it, Reg, uh, Medical Regulatory Board, came into my office, uh, told me something was bad. Uh, I had actually been aware the pharmacy below my office is where my patient had filled his medicines, and I had retained a lawyer uh, at that time. However, when I called the lawyer and said, they're here, he wasn't available. And the DEA agent said, we'd like you to surrender your DEA registration. And I didn't know very much about how these things worked at the time. So I said, if, if I prove that I'm right, will I get it back? And they said, yes. But what I didn't realize is that if you surrender it, you have the burden of proof to show that you should receive it. If you don't surrender it, they have the burden to take it away from you. In any event, I retained another returning, and we had a hearing before the DC board. 
And the attitude of the members of the board was a perfect reflection of the conventional and, I would say, ignorant understanding of pain and opioid treatment. The, yeah, Billy Hurwitz did a wonderful job of outlining what's happened, and it's been replicated roughly 2,000 times. Now, think of the loss to society of all of that medical competence and professional caregiving because they are allowing individuals who can count pills but not evaluate medical care to determine the propriety of the use of opiates for patients suffering from acute pains. Dr. Alex DeLuca is here with us. Please join me in welcoming him here to the National Press Club. <clears throat> uh, train at the uh, National Institute of Health at Albert Einstein School of Medicine in New York at uh, Prince George Hospital, and I started my practice here in Rockville. Uh, my nightmare started in uh, February 2nd, 2010. Uh, a nightmare started with this. Over a hundred officers in SWAT teams, a combined task team, of uh, FBI, DEA, local police from Montgomery County. They were on my front lawn. Over 20 trucks, each of them labeled drugs, uh, cash, uh, dynamite, cocaine. Each truck expected to load this evidence out of my house. When I opened the door in a classic Gestapo tactic, uh, I uh, was received by a revolver right here, a machine gun here, and another machine gun here from the DA agent and FBI. They told me, cooperate. I was in my underwear, they put handcuffs on me, and I said, of course I will cooperate. It's pill counters, that's what we're up against. Anyone who takes an innovative stand, who tries to approach the serious pain brain problems suffered by real Americans, with treatment that actually does them good receives the heavy hand of the DEA. You've seen it three times. And here is the fourth from a man who has had a distinguished career. He has been a pioneer in many different aspects and we're here this evening to express our support because he's not just one more statistic, he's an illuminating case and a lightning rod and it's my great honor to introduce for you now Alan J. Solarian. Uh, thank you, Jim, and thank you, everybody. This is my farewell. Uh, I'm, I'm mixing goodbye and also sharing. I thought about how to say goodbye to my people. I don't know whether I will be gone for four months, six months, eight months, but I know I will be gone for a while. And I thought I would just tell stories, tell stories of other people like Alex. Uh, Alex is my hero. Uh, he rambled around and perhaps people had difficulty following him, but I want you to know he is my hero. He has been an inspiration. He has been a leader. He has articulated the legal, ethical, moral issues for pain doctors. There is Judy here, my beloved life. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Jeannie. I cannot say enough. And thank you, Mary, for coming here. Jim, you know, you're my hero. I cannot say enough. Thank you, David, my boy. <laughs> Chloe, my daughter. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, thank you. One way to tell my story is uh, to remember other victims. And two of them are very special to me. Uh, one of them is John Merzak, some of you I think know, psychiatrist, a beautiful man, somebody who suffered just because he volunteered to help me, 
somebody who did not appreciate, perhaps until it was too late, the risk of being a doctor. I asked 18 people to cover for me when my DA license was taken, and John Merzek was the only soul who had the courage to say, okay, Alan, I will do it, and he did it. I won't get lost in details. It took only nine months and confidential records for him to be profiled, and one day, exactly as it happened to Billy, they came and knocked on his door, and they said, we want to see your files, and he said, go ahead. Within 24 hours, his license was gone. Within, I think, six months, he was bankrupt, and within nine months or ten months, he was dead. It was definitely stress-induced. Yes, he died of a bleeding ulcer, but I had a chance to speak with John a week before. He was distraught. He was destroyed. He did not know what hit him. He died, in my mind, for one reason, for being a good doctor and taking his Hippocratic oath seriously. There is another soul. Right now, she, she couldn't be here with us. Linda Cheek, who is in prison. And this woman, a psychiatrist, practice in Roanoke, Virginia, and Southwest Virginia, for over 40 years, and mostly in community mental health centers, and mostly for her church and other nonprofit organizations, never billing anybody a penny. And now, I think she's serving some time. The details do not matter. All I know is that these are very ugly examples of criminalization of medicine. This is not what we're all about. So now, tonight, we're talking about six people. Each one's story is a little different. But the major point is, we have six doctors from six different worlds facing a, a horrible outcome for one reason, because we're criminalizing medicine for no other reason. And that is really the point that I want to emphasize. That's why we're gathering here tonight. I don't want anybody to cry and hold my hand and say, okay, what's the big deal? I'm going somewhere. But the important thing for us is to know that this is not right. There is no other, as Alex said, there is no other Western country where doctors are regulated by policemen. It's insane. What does a cop know? What does a policeman know about medicine or neuroscience? How long does it take for somebody to become a doctor? This is an issue please hold on to, if nothing else. About my own case, I'm not going to try too long. Uh, I passed around these boring pages, but basically, my second main issue in life beyond medicine is for us, for humans, integrity matters. When deception comes, when there is no institutional integrity, we're in trouble. We're really in trouble. I don't care how successful and rich we are. And I don't just want you to believe me and take my word that I said I've been victimized because of dishonesty. If we have rules, if we have constitution, let's follow it. Or we don't have it. We should not change the rules and cheat and lie. And I'll go over one by one as to why I say this. The starting. 18 of my patients were stopped for sham traffic violations. They were all from Southwest Virginia. They were stopped because they were profiled, because their licenses could tell the local police that they were taking narcotics. Each one of them spent at least three nights in jail. And every single person after six months or nine months was exonerated. This is abuse of power. 
and patient confidentiality based upon DEA records. Another example, I have the evidence here. A Rockville doctor, Dr. David Katz, an ophthalmologist I've never met in my life, writes a letter to the DC licensing board and says, I'm a drug dealer and I only use cash. And he offers no evidence. And our licensing board accepts it. The very paper that the good doctor signed this, his name is Dr. David Katz. I want everybody to remember. I will forever remember his name. Dr. David Katz. On the same paper it says, any misrepresentation here is perjury. It's perjury. Because this is under oath. Okay? It ha has been now four years. He's still practicing nicely. Another sign of deception and evidence here. On April 4, 2012, after a lengthy and a special examination, DEA gives me my license for three years. My DEA license, that's the big authority. Federal DEA gives me stamps. Hey, Salarian, you're now licensed. The following day, Illegally, irrationally, Mayor Gray, Vincent Gray, by executive orders, su summary suspension of my DEA license, overruling the very license I had gotten from DEA. Okay, fine. Obviously, our laws permit this. Fine. The D.C. law says the system, the city has 10 days. After 10 days of administrative hearings, there has to be a decision. It's been exactly two years. There has not been any decision. So it's one two punch, one lie, one irrational order of overruling DEA, and then a judge or a system that seems to be paralyzed. Deception number three. Here is an interesting one that I love telling about. DEA came to our house, took three cars, fine, $168,000, fine. A year later, Montgomery County sends us a ticket for $80, speeding with my car. Speeding, joyride, Montgomery County is sending me the ticket. This is insane. It's shameless. DEA, joyride. Hear how bad we have become. This is a pharmacy report. I want name the pharmacy, with dozens of names of doctors and patients, their medication records, totally confidential, circulated around to the DC licensing board and others who have no right to see this very private record. Okay, How did I discover it? I discovered this during my uh, license hearings. Why should I know this person? And then actually, I happened to recognize a name, a former partner's wife taking a medication. Oh my God, this is insane. And this has become our system. Deception number six. Another deception. I was invited to a little town, uh, Cedar Bluff, corner of Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia, Virginia, Southwest Virginia. Two reporters invited from Voice. I'm a participant there with my good friends, Shabon Reynolds and Kevin Byers, Vanessa Mullins, a couple of other guys. Seven of us went there to participate in a public forum 
And here we're participating in a public forum with congressmen. There's a state congressman, Phil Puckett, and another state representative, Will Moorefield. And guess what? We're being filmed by DEA agents without our knowledge. My participation then becomes, how do I know all those things? My trial that I never had <clears throat> revealed a lot of data. And one of them was, oh, there is a tape of you from that conference. <coughs> and that tape now is given, this is the funny part, I talk with my hands, as you know, okay? And I shout, yeah, I know. That tape has been watched by the government psychologist who had watched the tape and by watching the tape concluded that I am mentally insane because of my mannerism. How ugly it could get. It cannot get any worse than that. It's not about the psychologist. Here the deception is, if my government wants to tape me, show me the courtesy and asking, do I want to be taped? It's as simple as that. Do the reporters know? Do the congressmen know? Or are we going to accept this as normal behavior? Another one. CVS pharmacies bought up bottles stamping and saying, Dr. Slurian is under DEA investigation, 2009. 2009. And CVS nationwide boycotting my prescriptions for any kind, even when I had a valid license. These are all illegal. At a minimum, unethical things that our society shouldn't tolerate because it's wrong. It crosses the line. No doubt what DEA did when the Brain Pain Festival Global Pain Awareness Day was comical and ugly. They sabotaged it. We got a ticket for a show we had permission for. We had countless uh, reports of people coming from Southwest Virginia having flat tires or slash tires or running out of gas with something going wrong with their gas tanks. But now, if one or two people say that, here, dozens of people reported that. Uh, I will bring it to closure this way. Integrity matters for us, not simply medicine, but on Earth. Without integrity, we're in trouble. This is not only about uh, medicine and doctor-patient confidentiality, but it's about the importance of institutional integrity. That is, if we have integrity, we must fight for the truth and say, these are not the right way of confronting even problems with addiction or problems with crime because we're then cheating. That's the important message from me that I want to emphasize. So there is a message of pain, pain of my colleagues, but as importantly, the importance of integrity that I am pretty sure each one of us, the six people that we're recalling, each one of us was stripped because of some kind of trick and dishonesty. I know from my own experience. Stop here. Alan J. Solarian. The American people must understand about this case. This man 
has been directed by the court to report to Butler, North Carolina prison facility at noon tomorrow, where he's going to be incarcerated for psychiatric evaluation. I wrote to the court myself and explained there was nothing here that could not be done on a voluntary outpatient basis. What is the benefit of incarcerating this man in a distant prison at taxpayer expense? It's not only a needless waste of taxpayer money, but it imposes enormous burdens on his wife Judy, his daughter Chloe, and his other sons. It's an outrage. Let me remind you who this man is. He practiced here in Washington for 40 years. He was a consultant to the FBI. This man was the FBI's top shrink for five years. He's a life member of the American Psychological Association, a diplomat of the American Forensic Medical Examiners and the president of Doctors for Equal Rights for Physical and Mental Pain. And he is being incarcerated because he has been innovative in seeking to find new methods to relieve the pain and suffering of other Americans. You think about it. This is a gross injustice and an outrage every American deserves to know.